our prayer for illumination. Illumine us, O God, bless us with ears to hear your truth, vision to discern your path, and feet ready to move into action, responding to your call. Guide us and inspire us in this moment of proclamation. Amen. Our unison reading this morning is Isaiah 44, verses 6 to 8. Can you join me in reading this? Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Beside me there is no God. Who is like me? Let them proclaim it. Let them declare and set it forth before me. Who has announced from of old the things to come? Let them tell us what is to see it. Do not hear or be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declared it? You are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? There is no other rock. I know not one. Hey, good morning. Oh. So it's Benjamin and Joshua. Got it? Is Sophia here and she's just being shy? No, she's home. Okay. And hello. How are you, Teresa? Okay. The, the beauty of these... Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Gone with the wind. Um, I, I need to move over to the side. Um, the beauty of these fans is that we're cool, but it's, I'm having a hard... Can, you, can everybody hear okay? Yeah. Okay. You can hear fine. All right. So we were just talking about Almighty God in the passage that we just read. Almighty. What does that mean? Almighty. All-powerful, can do anything? That's the answer, right? And do you think, gosh, I'm going to sit. Do you think that anything comes as a surprise to God? Say that again? Probably not, right? That God knows all about us. I mean, it says in scripture that God knows how many hairs that we have on our head. Can you imagine? Yeah, and now they're like, ah, right? Uh, so, Benjamin and Joshua, I lost you. All right. So, do you think that anything about you would come as a surprise to God. Like there's parts of you that you have to hide from God. You don't have to, because God knows, right? Uh, do you ever make faces? For fun? Do you, can I see a, um, like if you're looking in the mirror, do you have a, what, what's a happy face look like? Right? Teresa's going to struggle with this one. Th there you go. <laughs> what does a scared face look like? Awesome. <gasps> yeah. Right. Oh, perfect. Like your whole body. Like your, oh, that's perfect. Um, what about being silly? What's a silly face? <laughs> I want to know. Okay. Uh, Benjamin and Teresa, you owe uh, Joshua a cookie after this because he's totally rocking it with all these faces. Thank you. Right? We, can, we are only silly with people that we trust to be silly with. Isn't that, isn't that true? And that when you find somebody that you can be totally silly with in yourself, that's a gift. And I was thinking that, you know, with God, every part of us, the parts that, you know, our, our silly selves, when we're afraid, when we're, feeling, when we're feeling confident, all of that, God knows and God loves. And there's nothing that we ever have to hide from God there's no part of ourselves that we ever have to hide from God because God is also, another word for God is love. God loves us. 
absolutely and completely our silly selves, when we're afraid, when we're uh, whatever. God loves us no matter what, and we don't have to hide anything from God. Does that make sense? Because God knows it all anyway. Not like God's a know-it-all, but God knows it all. Shall we say a prayer? Fold our hands, close our eyes, bow our heads. Dear God, thank you for knowing us completely. Thank you for loving us completely. And Lord, give us confidence that we never have to hide anything from you. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I don't know. Our gospel lesson this morning continues through the Gospel of Matthew. Right after the passage that we read last week about the, the sowing of the seed, here's another one about sowing seeds. Jesus put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, an enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, then do you want us to go gather them? But he replied, no, for in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then there's a couple parables that come in between that. And then, then he left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples approached him saying, explain to us a parable of the weeds of the field. And he answered, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers. And they will throw them into the furnace of fire where, they will be, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Let anyone with ears listen. Let us join our hearts in prayer. Gracious God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts might be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Last week, during the prayers, I prayed for my friend who just lost her son to an overdose. This is the third family that I have known personally who has lost an adult son to an overdose. And I attended the funeral on Tuesday. It was my first day back from vacation. And I heard the news when I was away. And I imagined how I would like to craft the funeral, should I be asked to officiate. It is not part of our tradition to have a time of wailing. But I thought, well, before we get to the words of consolation, can we just, like, collectively, and I'm not going to do it, but, like, together. Sometimes there are no words, right? And then I thought I might lead an honest prayer that expresses the anger of the community plagued by overdoses, and I heard my heart saying, <laughs> a scourge upon the people who manufacture the drugs and who distribute the drugs. And then I laughed. I'm like, what does that even mean? It sounds fitting. And then I asked myself, well, even if I don't know what that means, what do I mean by it? And then I was thinking that the same thing should happen to those people. 
And then I thought, what am I praying for? More suffering? More death? When I pray a scourge upon the souls of those who willingly cause others to suffer, then I've implicated myself. I looked up the word in Greek used in this passage for enemy. Verse 27, and the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? And he answered, an enemy has done this. And in the Greek, the literal Greek reads, a, an, an enemy, a man, meaning a human being, has done this. And the word for enemy, when I uh, further looked it up, was explained as a person resolved to inflict harm. And I thought, didn't I just do that with my heart and my prayer? When I l allow, when we allow anger and hatred to rule our, be our being, then we become what we hate. And we become an enemy to the world. A scourge, by the way, is a whip, an instrument of punishment. And I don't know if you remember this, but last week during the prayers of the people, I prayed for my friend's family, and the words that came out of my mouth were, I pray for transformation for the people who allowed this to happen. And I, in my own heart, I was thinking, is that the right prayer, Lord? Is that the faithful prayer? Is that an honest prayer? And you must be thinking, but there must be a place for righteous anger. Absolutely. Absolutely. Absolutely, but Jesus has nothing to say in this passage about righteous anger. He's worried about how we do our weeding. This parable starts, the kingdom of God may be compared to, and another way of saying that, which I think is, is really nice, Michael Joseph Brown writes that you could write it this way, the way God acts, relates to, and affects his followers is like the following story. And in this story, God is the ultimate judge. We are not. We are not to try to weed out the bad ones. Now, the photo this morning for the slides, that's thistle. My backyard has Canada thistle. It is the bane of my gardening existence. They take over. They go to flower. It's a pretty purple flower. I saw a bee on it the other day, and I'm like, oh, it's a pollinator. Isn't it lovely? But when it goes to seed, it, it blows with the wind like a dandelion, right? And its, and its wishes of world domination take over because it's really invasive. And if you cut it, it only becomes more vigor vigorous. And we cut it last year without knowing. So this year, I'm, the, you'll love this, I'm cutting each of them individually and poisoning the stalks of each weed, praying that it does not replicate itself. I could spray weed killer on it, but then it would kill all the beautiful things around it too, even the flowers that I appreciate. But when it comes to people, from this passage, we understand that it is not our role to rip people up by the roots and throw them to the side hoping they'll die. Because then we would become like the enemy. This parable, by the way, is unique to Matthew. None of the other Gospels have it except the Gospel of Thomas, which of course didn't make it into the canon. And I said last week about these parables that some scholars believe that these explanations of the parables are a later addition, but it made it in, and so we get to struggle with them. I like the fact that in the explanation it says, the Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all the causes of sin and evildoers. I like the fact that it says all the causes of sin. 
It could be translated all the stumbling blocks. And this, this is where we get real. Truth be told, we can all be stumbling blocks. And none of us are, are pure good or pure evil. And we're clear about that in our Reformed theology, the theology of the Presbyterian Church, that we can be fantastically wonderful and we can also be ingeniously creative about our screw-ups. That's who we are and who we will always be. And being mindful of that, I believe, makes us better people because it keeps us humble. Maybe the weeding that happens when it's time for the harvest is the release of the captives, the breaking of chains, of, of chains the things that, that cause us to hurt ourselves and one another and our world like addiction and hate and greed and envy. Weeded from within us and finally, we will find ourselves liberated, joyful, whole in a way that we have never experienced despite all of our striving. But Jesus tells us in the meantime, we are not called to judge one another and try to weed each other out. Like using Roundup there'd be nothing left. And I have, you know, uh, I, I'm debating it. Yeah, the, if, talk to me about Roundup in the, in the coffee hour, the evils of Roundup. Don't use it. What's also interesting in this passage is that the word for weed in this passage refers to a specific plant. It's named, and it looks just like wheat and you can't tell the difference until they've matured. They look alike. And albeit the church would love to interpret this passage as, you know, oh, all the good church people, we're all wheat, and other folks, they're all the weeds. Some interpret this passage that it's talking to the church, that within the church there are weeds as well as wheat. And this is when we can all look at each other and go, hmm, hmm, jacuzzi. I don't know why. I had in an, a history lesson when I was in, in, in high school where the, the, profe the teacher, the professor, had us all going, jacuzzi, I accuse you. Pastor Robin in the living room with the candlestick, right? It's me. We're all guilty of being hypocrites of not getting it right, of not understanding, of leading others astray, of judging, of playing God. But would it not be better for us, rather than to look at one another, to look inside and bow our heads in prayer, recognizing that we all fall short of the glory of God? And if the reaper of the harvest does not use grace as a winnowing as a winnowing tool, then we all fall down. I don't like that the interpretation of this parable incites fear in our hearts. I prefer to kneel before the Lord, asking that the weeds in my heart that I have mistaken as gospel, but are truly a false gospel, might be borne out and plucked out of my spirit, including the righteous fury that wants to cause harm to others. And as a reminder, later in this Gospel of Matthew, Jesus will call Peter a stumbling block, and yet he is forgiven, and upon him the church was built. What if we were to read this passage as a promise that we will be saved from all that causes us to stumble? that the false gospels that we have bought into will be exposed. And our ability to worship God with all our body, mind, soul, and strength will finally come to a fruition in a way that, that truly, as if purified in a fire, we will give glory to God with all of our being.
May it be so. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.